Welcome to Code Club! So this is something I promised to do for a while, is uh, actually look at some of my code, and uh, we will read it, parse it, discuss it, criticise it, in our usual manner. But I'm hoping you'll go easy on me. Just kidding. <laughs> you should rip it to shreds. Uh, and I have to say, I haven't looked at most of this code for a while, so there will be some stuff. Which is okay. So I'll just say a word about why this library exists. Um, because as most of you know, I've sort of retired from DevOps and infrastructure work now, but I've been doing it for 25 years or so, and I've written a lot of scripts as part of that. All sorts of system automation, installing stuff, configuring stuff, deleting stuff, uh, ETL stuff, automation, monitoring, and all kinds of things. And I wrote it all in Shell, which uh, is pretty unpleasant. I mean, Shell is great for one-off pipelines and little utility scripts and things like that. But as soon as you start trying to build programs out of them, it gets difficult because, well, how do you test stuff? You know, there are libraries for Shell testing, but it's not built in. Um, dealing with variables, um, any kind of structured data is really unpleasant because it's like in shell you've basically got one type which is string haven't you so <laughs> everything's some kind of string and it's full of quotes and backspaces and new lines and it's very difficult to handle um, on, on bash 3 we, we have arrays haha <laughs> yeah well there you go <laughs> so give it another 50 years and uh, it'll turn it into a real programming language but you know i jest but the thing is um shell scripts are really good at certain things which is sort of gluing stuff together. I would characterize it as, you know, run this program, give it some input, get some output, send it to this other program. We've all probably seen sort of, uh, you know, heinous shell one-liners, which do really cool stuff. And now I'm kind of like, you know, once I got into Go, I was kind of thinking, why can't I write the automation programs that I need to write using Go? And the answer is, it's a real pain. Um, Take take a typical example is maybe you want to look in your Apache logs and you want to grep out all the IP addresses of all your requests and you want to say, is anyone hitting my web server too much? You know, maybe um, cut out all the IP addresses, count their frequency, find the top 10 most frequent requesters and give me that information so I can see if somebody is um, scraping my site maybe or I'm getting DDoSed, that kind of thing. Uh, that's really nice in Shell because we can do like, you know, we can uh, use cut to strip out the column of information we're interested in. We can use grep to match certain things. We can use uh, WC to count uh, frequencies. We can use sort to sort it and so forth. And then we can use head to say, give me the top 10. So because, you know, it, this is why... Um, all shell data is strings, basically, isn't it? It's a sort of line-oriented processing. You, you, things, Unix utilities just read streaming data from standard input and send something to standard output. Now, if we want to do that in Go, we have some issues because, you know, first of all, I need to open the file and then there may be an error from that, so I have to check that. And then I want to read each line and match the strings and there could be errors from that. So I have to keep checking errors at every point which, as you all know, I love to do in Go, but uh, it just makes it a little inconvenient because we can't write these neat little pipeline expressions. Um, I've got an example here um, of something like that. Is uh, So th take this pipeline expression, which, uh, excuse me, is exactly the type of thing I'm talking about so we, we use cut to get the column that reads the access log we sort them we use unique to get the counts and we sort them by frequency so most number of requests first and then head to give us the top 10. So to write that in Go would be long and verbose with lots of error checking and I really want to make it just as easy as that and I sort of have done in that you know you can use the script library to do something like this and you read it in exactly the same way. Um, we start with standard in. Um, the output of standard in goes to 
a method called column, which takes a number to say, give me the first column of white space separated data, then pipe it through freak, and that gives me frequencies, just like unique. Give me the first 10, and then send it all to standard out. And that's not too hard to understand, is it, if you're used to shell scripts? At least I hope it's not. Yeah. Does that I mean, sort of make sense? Yeah, you, you are saying that for me, right? Because we had the lesson yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you all encounter this at some point, I'm sure. Um, and it's, you know, most Go programs don't look like this, of course, but shell scripts often do. And what I'm really trying to do is just give people an easy way into Go if they're coming from a DevOps or a sysadmin type background, maybe. And they're saying, yeah, I'm used to writing these nice pipeline constructions in shell. Can I do the same thing? So this is designed to help them. And of course, if you were just doing this, you might say, well, just use shell, which is perfectly fine. But the problem arises, you know, if we start to want some logic around this stuff. So we may want to say, you know, um, maybe I have a list of bad IPs, which are kind of known offenders. And I want to see if any of those are in there and are matching IPs and things, and it suddenly starts to become quite horrible to have to do that in Shell. So when we want to do logic, we can use Go, which is great for that stuff. And when we want to do basic scripting things, um, we have some facilities in the script library that uh, make it easy to do that. And this is definitely my far and away most popular ever open source project. I think it's like 1.6k stars on GitHub and rising. I never really know what GitHub stars mean, but I think it means I like it, you know. <laughs> so I think a lot of people like it, whether they use it or not, I don't know. Um, but they can, and it's got many contributors, um, because it's the sort of thing that you can always add little methods to, to do helpful things, isn't it? Um, and we'll see some of the things uh, that you can do with it. Um, so here's some, here's some examples. Um, one thing about this readme, which I always advise to people, is the very first thing in your readme should be this import statement. Um, in fact, I should have put it up e even higher than I have. Uh, it should be the very first thing, because that's usually why people want your readme, as they say. How the heck do I import this thing, anyway? So that's the first thing. And then the second is, show me some examples, because I'm not sold <laughs> on whether I want this library yet, right? You know, very often readmes are kind of like, so here's the exhaustive documentation from page one onwards. And you haven't really sold it to me as yet. I, I need to know why would I even use this? And here's the answer. So um, if we're just opening a file and getting the contents, um, that is, you know, it's completely trivial to do in script as you'd expect. And then it starts to get interesting because you can say, I'm just gonna pipe that entire file to a method called count lines. And of course, that returns a number, as you'd expect, and an error. And the point is, you know, you can keep chaining these things together. So we can say match only lines that contain the string error and then count those. And of course, any of these things could error at any point, like test.txt might not exist. Um, but you'll notice we didn't have to check it each time. So you might say, well, what if it doesn't exist? What happens when you call match? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> because... Um, everything in script is a pipe, which is just like a normal Unix pipe. Um, what that means is, you know, line oriented text data. Um, but it also has an error flag, if you like. And what that says is an error happened somewhere along this pipeline. One of these operations went wrong and all of the subsequent methods now just say, okay, well then I'm just a no op in that case. You know, when match oh, is called here, Sorry, well, so, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to ask, so like the errors as values pattern or the the error writer pattern kind of. Yeah, yeah, you got me. I didn't invent that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I stole, stole, steal from the best, as you know. And um, this is a very well-known pattern in Go is basically saying if you have a dozen things to do, each of which can error, then just wrap, wrap this with a little struct with an error value on it and you can set that 
at any time if anything errors and then everything else just says first thing I do is I check if there's been an error if so I just know up I just return nothing um, and that means it's completely safe to run this pipeline it won't panic or anything what you can do is you can check this error value at the end and that will tell you oh something went wrong somewhere and now I know my pipe is not valid um, but it's just a bit more convenient um, and of course a lot of Unix tools just read standard input and filter it in some way and send it to output so that's very easy and we have a bunch of other cool things that we can do especially writing stuff to files um, lots of adverts subliminal adverts here as you scroll through for my mentoring services books <laughs> etc um, and that's fine so you, you can read the readme online but let's get into the code um, so uh, let's see Tom perhaps uh, would you start us off and would you maybe where should we start looking in amongst this code because we have some tests which might be interesting to look at and we have some machinery which is also possibly interesting and maybe I mean you mentioned pipes were kind of like the everything well even on the screen right now everything is a pipe yeah so either pipes tests or pipes.go would seems like an interesting place to start great so when I was thinking about this library, I was thinking, you know, I know I want to do pipelines. So I want to be able to chain these methods uh, like this. Um, now what does that mean? So that means obviously if I, I want to call match on something, let's say. So what, what I call that method, so that's a method already. So what I call that method on, it has to be a struct of some kind. Or it doesn't have to be a struct, but that's the most useful thing to call it on. So how does that work exactly? I mean, I was kind of turning this over in my mind and you, you all probably know the answer right away, but it took me a while to get there. Is I was thinking what I need is something that I can basically just read from, like I can read it line by line or read the whole thing. And I need someone else to be able to read from me. <laughs> you know, is there a mechanism in Go which I could use? that says basically I don't care what kind of value you are as long as I can read from you um, and the answer is io.reader so <laughs> this gets used a lot in Go programs with good reason and I just was thinking about it and I just went of course just make everything a reader <laughs> it's so obvious right you probably wonder why it took me so long to figure out um, so we'll see how that works so basically everything we have this type called script.pipe which is that object that you call methods on. It has a zillion methods. Um, and what's inside that struct is, well, we'll see. Um, it's basically a reader. So this is real simple, right? I mean, this is the core of the whole library. It's just, it's just a struct that contains a reader and an error. We already talked about that. Now, there might be a question about this, which I'm anticipating. So the first problem that I ran into when I was doing this was saying, what about closing stuff? <laughs> Maybe the same question occurred to you, right? We, we have streaming data propagating through all of this pipeline, and then at the end, we're, we're sort of done with it. But by that time, we have no idea what we were reading from. Could have been a file, could have been a network connection, standard input, anything. What if we need to close it? Because if we don't, we're going to leak that file handle. And we don't want to do that or whatever it is or maybe it doesn't need to be closed in which case we mustn't close it um, we can't so what I thought was maybe what we do is instead of an IO reader we use I invent this type called read auto closer which is just simply something that closes itself once it's been read is that making any sense yeah, that makes That's, sense to me. I never really know what's obvious and what's not, but the, you know, you can see the problem, can't you? That by the time I get to the end of the pipeline, I want to close the thing, but I no longer have it. <laughs> I don't, I don't have that file handle um, to close, or even know what kind of thing it is that might need closing. So it's relatively trivial to write 
something which does that because if you think about it um, your uh, let's look at read auto closer uh, it needs to contain the reader and for technical reasons we want the read closer interface not just reader because we're saying we might want to call close on it and you can only do that if you've asserted it's a read closer so in our read method we just simply wrap that reader we call its read method when it tells us end of file we tell it to close and that's it sort of pleasantly simple isn't it and because you're implementing read and close, you can pass it in as a read closer. Yeah, exactly. So um, the reader on the pipe, as we saw, is just a read auto closer, which means um, I can happily read from it, not just directly, but I can chain any number of other methods onto it, which do a bunch of reading. And they don't have to worry about the paperwork because it's all taken care of. When the very last byte has been read, from that whatever it is its read method will ensure that um we'll get we'll get eof here and we'll close it um and if it's not a closer that's okay so to create the read auto closer we obviously take a reader and we say is it a closer um, f yes, if it is, fine. We assert it's a read closer. We know that will work because we just checked it. Um, it can never happen that that type assertion fails, but if it does, panic. In fact, that did fail when I ran this code under... Uh, there's, there's a Go interpreter. I've forgotten the name now. It would be good if I'd reminded myself of that, but... You can look this up. There's a, there's a Go interpreter to sort of run, you run Go in a REPL or run scripts um, like Shell. And it's, it's very close to implementing all of Go, um, but just with some weird corner cases. Like this one, is it? <laughs> it panicked here in that the type assertion to io.closer succeeded, but then type asserting to read closer failed. Even though we know it's a reader, now we know it's a closer, so it should be a read closer, but it's not. <laughs> so I'm happy to say this does work under regular Go. Um, so who would like to ask something about this? Or shall we move on? Well, maybe it's a dumb question, but why could you use a defer function to close the file? Why? Where would oh, I de where would I defer it though? That's the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, the point is that what I need to do is t take some reader and pass it on to someone else and say, "Here, knock yourself out. Read as much as you like from this." <laughs> mm -hmm. So if yeah. I de if I defer closing it, it, it'll get closed before you even get a chance to look at it, and they mm -hmm. can't defer closing it because they don't have it in that sense. So th this is a bit of sort of jiggery pokery, which. Um, you know, you're not expected to understand, as the classic Unix source code comment says. Um, but the point is, it makes everything else work. So, um, so we're back here, Tom. So, would you like to start guiding us through this? And we'll just sure. look and see what questions come up. Um, okay, so um, we have a method, or I should say, a function to uh, create a new pipe. Um, it's going to give us back a pointer to a pipe um, that's uh, or to an empty pipe, I should say. Yep. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Of course, at that point in time, there's no, there's nothing. There's no actual reader inside the read closer, read auto closer, I should say. Um, presumably, whenever we do something later, that'll populate. Exactly. Um, we, um, a pipe needs to know how to close. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm just reading the comment before I read the code <laughs> quickly. <Yeah. laughs> so, so just referring back to read auto closer for a second. So I, I, I kind of yada yada over what happens if it's not actually an IO closer. So for example, if you opened a file with os.open, that would be a closer because files need closing. If you used a strings new reader, for example, that wouldn't be a closer. There's nothing to close, really. 
Um, so what we say is, is it if it's not a closer, the thing is I'm going to want to call close on it in the future. So I just use this thing called ioutil.notcloser, which basically wraps whatever you give it in something that has a close method that, of course, does nothing. That makes sense. Very useful. So if, if you have something where you're saying, I'm going to call close on this no matter what, and I don't want that to panic, um, and it, it may not be a closer, so I, if it doesn't have a close method, I just want to give it a dummy one. So that's how that works. And you sometimes see see this used for HTTP testing, for example, where of course HTTP request bodies and response bodies are also closes and need closing. And if we're testing those, we probably pass in can data using a strings reader or a bytes buffer or something like that, in which case we probably want to wrap it in an op closer. So, sorry I interrupted you, carry on. Uh, yeah, I mean, so that of course explain definitely explains the the comment there. Um, so we have a method on pipe called close, which returns an error, and it's essentially going to check to see if the pipe is empty. Yeah. Uh, first, okay. right, and then uh, if it's an empty, that's a, um, so you know, pipe of course is a struct, um, so we can check it with nil, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, and um, it's an interesting fact that um, nil is surprisingly useful in Go. You know, um, lots of things can be nil and still be useful. Um, you can append to nil slices, for example. Uh, you can call methods on nil structs, which uh, a lot of people don't know. That amazed me when I found out. I saw Francesc Campoy's talk about nil, um, and he showed that, and I was kind of like, why in the world would you want to do that? Um, and there are some cases where, you know, your struct only exists to have methods on it and it doesn't really need to contain any data. So therefore, it's it's going to be nil um, or empty. Um, so it's very useful to make sure that if you write things that have methods, it's always really useful to make sure they can be safely called on nil. If that's meaningful. Uh, so like example. a scenario <clears throat> a scenario for an empty struct might be if you're implementing some kind of interface um right to get the behavior but you don't actually need any state yeah exactly you, you can imagine scenarios where you might say oh this could be nil and that's absolutely fine the only thing is i i refer to something like p.reader which would just panic if this was nil so to avoid that i want this library to be completely panic proof um and, you know, uh, so one way I do that is I exhaustively test it by calling every single method that pipes have, first on nil and then on an empty pipe, um, to make sure none of them error, which is a useful thing to do. But yes, yeah, so, so it's always useful to make sure that you're nil safe. Um, and if, if there's nothing you can do in the nil case, then do nothing. And if you, if you think in this code looks really dumb and basic, then I accept your compliment <laughs> with gratitude. And that's exactly the type of code that I'm aiming to write is that it's so obvious that we don't even really need to ask about it, but we can. This is great. Um, so I think we know what close does. Yep. Um, uh, error um, is another method on pipe. It's checking for its nil state, and it's just going to return um, whatever the value of error is inside the struct. That's right. Um, and this is a slightly interesting one, because one thing we can do in pipelines, of course, is run arbitrary commands. Um, I the one other reason for this library was also I was working on uh, working for clients where they're deploying stuff to Kubernetes and other container platforms. Go tools built in Scratch containers, right? So we've got nice small binaries um, 
with no dependencies or config files or anything. And um, one of the things there, of course, is if you're in a scratch container, you have no Unix user land. You don't have grep, you don't have shell, you don't have echo or any of these things. So people who are used to casually shelling out to things, <laughs> you know, uh, all of a sudden they get a nasty shock because they're like, ah, that, that stuff just doesn't exist. In fact, nothing exists except this binary and probably the CA certificates. Um, so uh, this is one reason that I always counsel people to do that kind of logic in Go instead of shelling out, like Tiago and I had this conversation about grepping for stuff. Um, one, because you might find yourself without a user land, and two, it makes your program more portable, of course. Um, and so one thing I was aiming to do with this library is supply some of that Unix user land stuff. You know, like, um, for example, there's a little table here which shows you if, oh, if you know Unix, here's what you do with this library. If you if you were going to use cat, you know, instead you call file or concat. If you're going to use grep, you use match or match regex. Um, head becomes first and so forth. So what I've done is basically keep the same kind of functionality, but not necessarily the names. Because if you don't know Unix, some of these names are going to be very weird to you. <laughs> like, what the heck is grep about? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> we're probably familiar with that. Some of us might even know why it's called that. But that makes no sense at all to somebody who's new to programming. Um, so this is why I have this table saying, you know, it works like head, but it's called something different. Um, so, um, of course, um, if, if what you want is not something that's built in here, and if you do have a user land to call, then you can call um, exec just takes any arbitrary command line and runs it and we would often like to be able to get the exit status and what we do in that case is um, we capture the exit status and then we set the pipe's own error to that exit status string so we can look at it and we have a method for that so that you can say Oh, what was my um, what was the exit status from this command answer one or something so that's why that exists and I think the rest of this probably yeah, is not that interesting um, by design so should we look at some of the actual user facing methods now so I think this is where it starts to get interesting so we understand vaguely how pipes work um, so now let's start creating some pipes. So, um, Tiago, would you help us out here? Maybe start walking us through some of these. If if it's not obvious, by all means, say <laughs> it's not obvious, John. What the heck are you doing? Okay. So we are creating a function args that takes nor no arguments and returns a pointer to a pipe. That's right. It's worth saying all of these things are about creating new pipes. So they're not methods on pipes that read anything. They're the sources of all pipes, which is why I put them in a file called sources.go. So all of the code falls into three categories, basically. It's a source, which creates a pipe. It's a filter, which filters a pipe. Or it's a sink, which is getting stuff out of the other end of the pipe. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Nope. And then you declare a new variable called s type strings builder. I don't know what the builder does. Oh, that's a neat little thing for just if you want to build up a big string by appending lots of little strings. Of course, you, you can do that in vanilla Go, but it, it's a little inefficient because strings being immutable, they, they get copied every time. So a strings builder just gives you something you can call write string on and uh, you keep calling right string it keeps appending and then you can get the entire string okay. so it's an efficient way to build up strings from fragments if you like okay and then you 
are iterating over the arguments um, starting on index one because index zero is the script name itself. Right. And then you write a string um, with the argument and in a new line. And then you return um, that string probably. It should be a method to read what you've, you have written before. Yeah. That's right, yeah, echo is one of ours which just creates a pipe from a string, so it's convenient to use that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you just declare the echo function, which is basically a new pipe with reader. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a new reader uh, of the string. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that this kind of explains itself doesn't it? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, by, by naming my methods in such a way, I, I hope that um, it makes it really clear what they do. And this is, it's, it looks a bit little bit like functional options, but it's not. Um, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, saying with so and so is really useful. Um, mm -hmm. If you have some struct and you just want to put something on it like config or something uh, like we saw when we looked at the context library right at context with cancel or with timeout mm -hmm. it's just like that it creates a pipe with a reader and we use strings reader so that's fine okay let's keep going and then uh, you'll have an exact function that takes a string and exact that in command and returns a pointer to the pipe. Yeah, because so we could, exec could be in the middle of a pipe, like we're executing a command and we're feeding all of the pipe contents to it, and then its output constitutes the rest of the pipe. Or maybe we're just starting the pipe with an exec. So it's a, you know, so rather than duplicate it, we just create an empty pipe, and then call the exec filter on it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just a wrapper. Okay. And you have a new function if exist that checks if file exists in the in the path you we specify the file name variable and then you check if there is an error and return with error or just return a new pipe. Yeah, an OS dot start. This might be familiar to some of us which basically it's like saying, if this thing exists, then tell me about it. If it doesn't, that's useful information too. Um, in this case, that's the only inf information we're interested in, uh, just whether or not it exists. So we might like to write pipes like saying, if exists, so-and-so.log, then do something with it. If not, forget it. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to do. One thing that I love in Go is that, like most functions, match the system call, so it's like easy to, at least for me, it's easy to understand what the function is doing. Yeah, that's largely from the people who brought you Unix, so uh, that's no coincidence, is it? <laughs> yeah. And after you have the file function that receives a string and returns a, pi a pointer to a pipe and then you start a new pipe and try to open the file and if there is an error you return the error or otherwise you return a reader pointing to the file that uh, was opened yeah exactly I have a quick question on that. Sure. So os.open, like the file permissions on that by default are just read, right? Mm, yes. yes. So I guess I don't know, but I assume you might want to do something with the file once you have it other than read. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, you can't <laughs> because... <laughs> because of the way script works. So th th this is kind of an unresolved issue for me, is I would like some way for pipes to be bidirectional. You know, I'd really like to be able to perhaps write back to the pipe, 
Um, because I haven't figured out how to do that yet, um, it is currently read only. And you, you're absolutely right. It, it would, it is useful to write to files, and we can in fact do that with some syncs. So there's an append file sync, um, which uses the um, uh, file permission flags to do yeah. exactly that. So that's where that comes in. Yeah, I think if you open with the create mode, you have uh, just write, right? So I don't think there is anyone who can read and write at the same time. Uh, uh, there is a file permission that allows read write. Yeah, because you can imagine if you were a database or something, that would be useful, wouldn't it? You want just a big block of disk um, that you can seek in arbitrarily write bits of it, read other bits of it. But that's very uncommon to do, I think, isn't it? Unless you're a database. And I'm almost sure you're not. Um, so, but uh, yeah. what I mean uh, for files, I think it... Well, I, I'm not... I, I didn't see at least in the OS library. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit I'm shaky on all of this file mode stuff, as I'd have to consult my junior color encyclopedia of Go to answer that properly. No problem. So, uh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's... Uh, this, this may be kind of interesting. This was a, a contribution from the wonderful world of open source. Yeah, um, it's basically a uh, find. Uh, you send a path and then you get create a a slice of string, and there is a walk function, which is a function that receives. So I think it's basically using, uh, when you call yourself, I forgot the name. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're there, borrowing this helpful um, file path walk from the standard library. And if you, you uh, the point is to get the all the files recursively. Right. Yeah, you, recursively, think, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, so just like, so the Unix find utility will walk all of these directories and say, okay, I'm going to look in all the directories inside those and give you all those files. So if you write a backup tool, for example, something like that, this would be really useful. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this, as everywhere else in this library, I try and stick as closely to the standard library as possible. You know, if there's a, a standard library function that does exactly what I want, I just call it. Um, I'm not dumb enough to imagine I'm clever enough to do better than a standard library. <laughs> um, or if there's something close, then I'll, I'll just, you know, wrap it. And if, if it takes a certain thing like a pattern or something or a certain set of arguments, I'll try and make mine behave exactly the same way. So if you, if you know shell, you know, you should feel at home if you know Go. You should not feel not at home with this stuff. So, yeah, so, so file path walk just says, give me a path to start with, and then give me a function um, that I will call for every single file I find in this tree. Yeah, and you check if it's a directory. Yeah, that's um, right. So, so in inside that func, which is just anonymous, um, or rather, it's not anonymous, um, but it's a literal. Um, we say, yeah, is it a directory? Because uh, we're not interested in directories. Mm -hmm. But if it isn't a directory, append it to my big list of file names, and uh, that's what we end up returning in the end. Yeah. So this find file should be find minus f in your table. Because it's not returning the directory. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. You said you, we should criticize your code. That's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah, or, or rather, you know, I can't legally stop you. But you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you don't read your own code from a couple of months ago and say, wow, what was I thinking? I could, I could really do better, <laughs> you know, then something's gone wrong because you, you should have learned some stuff. Um, 
And yeah, I think the second iteration it's always best. Each iteration you do better than the previous. Yeah, and w with the contributions to this library, I mean, I, there's lots of people who are new to Go contributing to this library, which is fantastic, and that's one of the reasons for doing it. Um, and I use it as kind of you know people people open issues and say I think it should work like this and. Uh, I use that as an opportunity to have a discussion with them about how we should design it. Mm -hmm. You know, say what's what's the use case that you want to do? What what code would make sense for that use case and be elegant and convenient and readable? And then we'll just make that happen. You know, r write the code that you want to write, and then just go implement whatever you need to make that code compile and work. And that's helpful. And then when they put in their PR, of course, I'll review it and say. You know, you could do this, you could do that. Did you know you can do this? Um, my code review style is definitely or changing these. from, hey, you got this wrong, to saying, yeah. did you know you can do <laughs> X, mm -hmm. Y, Z, which I think is much nicer. Yeah, um, or something like, this continue is doing nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and it's, it's the type of thing that, you know, you see yourself when you look at it through somebody else's eyes is why the review is so helpful but with you know with my own code i have no problem whatsoever with just relentlessly refactoring and refactoring and mm -hmm. uh you know my students know this <laughs> um and but with other people's contributions there comes a point where you know they've re they've resubmitted the pr like 16 times and i i, I sort of <laughs> i'm not quite you know i haven't really got the nerve to ask them to change it again so mm -hmm. Um, sometimes there may be things which is just, if I was writing it, I might have done it a different way, but I don't want to just completely crush the individuality out of someone's PR. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want them to feel it's their code, not mine. Yeah, and sometimes it's, something is open-aided, right? It's not um, be, best practice or, there. what I mean is some, there are small things that's acceptable uh, because it's not breaking any rule or principle, yeah. right? It's more opini opinionated. That's exactly right, and it's precisely the opinionated stuff that really matters, because that's where your intelligence and your judgment and your creativity and design thinking comes in. All of the stuff which is not controversial is just not interesting, because <laughs> it's a solved problem, right? When people talk about best practice, this is what they mean. It's just stuff we don't have to think about anymore. Because no one seriously disputes that way of doing it, um, and all the other stuff is where it's really interesting for me. So um, that was very good. Thank you, Tiago. Would someone else like to volunteer for the next bit? I take a stab at it. Great. I'd like to go around the room a little bit. Looks like we have a list files function being created that takes a path and returns a uh, pointer to pipe and checks to see we have a conditional here that or not a conditional. Uh, yeah, no, this is like if you if you do something like cat star in the shell, right? Yeah. You know, you can say some uh, some expression probably involving a star or other wildcard that expands to a whole bunch of files and we would like the same functionality and in fact it's in the standard library so of course we just use that right um, but yeah right. please continue and then uh, we're set of variable file names uh, in error check the file path glob if I'm correct for my Python days, is we just munch that path together. Uh, that's right. So we're saying if it contains any of these magic characters, which indicate globbing, like star, um, then clearly we're dealing with a glob. If not, it's just a list of files or just one file. But the, you know, the globbing is the bit we need to look at here to say, oh, there, there's some glob characters. We need to glob stuff. Right. Then we're checking that error and return um, the new pipe with an error or just return the slice 
of uh, file names that have been collected. Yep, slice just creates a pipe from a slice, which is often convenient. Yeah, I was I was wondering about that. Is that yeah. that standard or no? You create that. No, that's a script thing, and there's again, it's sort of just making it a little bit easier for people who might be new to go. Just saying, oh, I, I, I have a slice, and everything's a pipe. Okay, how do I turn a slice into a pipe? Okay, this sure. is how. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. It's easy to understand. Walk through. Um, then we take uh, files in an error. And we do an IOU tool and read the directory and pad, pass that path into that directory. Yeah, this basically gets us the list of stuff that's in that directory. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Again, check th the error. Thank you, Standard Library. You've saved me actually writing code. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to need to do something that isn't in the Standard Library and then I'll have a problem. All right. We are checking the error. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, we're checking the error and we're passing, uh, creating a variable s and error and passing that path to us. That stat to see if it's a match or if it's there. Yeah. So this might need a footnote, which is that saying if um, read dear. So if you give it something that's not a directory, it'll just give you an error. In which case, so what we're really saying here is. Um, that was either not a directory or we just can't read it for one reason or another. So we could bail out, but instead, before we do that, let's just check. Is it actually just one file? Right. No. Did they say list files foo.txt? In which case, of course, it won't be a glob, so this won't happen. It's not a directory, so that won't work. But it might be a file, so we can call our friend os.stat. Um, and we can say, nope, even that errored, so bail. And if that worked, then we have the stat. So we can say, is it a directory? Um, right. And if it's not, then, of course, what we're trying to do is get the list of all files that match that path. And in, in this case, that is precisely that one file. <laughs> so that's easy. Yes. So, yeah, very good. So... Just the last bit here. Yep, continues and uh, returns either that that path that's echoed out or the uh, the error from that not finding a directory or, or anything. We have a file names variable. We were making a string in, from the length of the files, and we range over yeah, those what, files. Yeah, what was files? It's a slice of OS dot file info. So what I want is a slice of strings, but instead I have a slice of os.file infos, so I need to range over them. Uh, yeah. I know exactly how many strings there will be, so I can pre-size my slice to the right size, avoids copying. And then right. I just boringly and verbosely write them all into my slice. Yeah, pretty straightforward. And I use filepath.join because not every operating system uses forward slashes <laughs> to separate um, sure. file paths, right? Although all the ones that anybody really cares about do use forward slashes. But um, it's good practice to pretend we might want stuff to run on Windows. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why we call that. That's great. So I want to get into a little bit of the filtering stuff. Uh, um, we... Just one one question before we move sure. forward. Um, could you just check if it's a file um, before run the IOU to read there um, to avoid the host checking you're doing? Before? Yeah, could I check if it's a file? I would have to call OS stat on it, wouldn't I? Or the function uh, exists you already have, if file exists. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, the problem with that is that creates a pipe. Oh, okay. Um, gotcha. So it's a bit inconvenient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you. so we're getting a little bit low on time, so I just want to touch on some of the filtering stuff, um, which, so, wait, 
Look at these imports. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. I've never knowingly imported container slash ring. Um, this is another contribution. So perhaps um, this is a bit more interesting because it's a bit more pipe centric. Like instead of just creating pipes, we're reading from pipes and writing to pipes. Um, who hasn't had a go yet? Jumana, I'd love to call on you, but at the same time, I don't want to put you too much on the spot if you don't feel like talking, so. Um, I could try, but this is pretty advanced for me. So if someone else wants to go, that's fine. Yeah, the, actually, the nice thing is you can just say what's there. And if it's not obvious to you what it does, you can just say, who can tell me what this does? OK. <laughs> um, so. Do we know what the Unix base name command does? Because that's quite helpful. Um, it's saying if you have some long path name with lots of directories and slashes in, actually I'm just interested in the file name, i.e. the very last bit. So I just want you to chop off all of the leading slashes and paths. So if it's slash users john go foo.txt, I just want foo.txt. So that's what so we're replicating here. So we're just trying to trim off all of those slashes. Okay. So so that's what ba base name does. That's right. So okay. we're going to be reading stuff. So we're on a pipe. So we're going to be reading from that pipes reader. And each line is some path that we want to strip the leading bits off. And then we will write to our output just those file names. And all, um, all these filter methods work. A very similar type of way which is the first thing it does i should explain is if if the pipe is nil just um, short circuit and no up as we talked about earlier and similarly if the error flag has been set on the pipe that means there was an error somewhere upstream so there's nothing for us to do so we just return ourselves if you like um, this this makes it a no up so you could chain a dozen of these together and they all just return p so at the end you just have p that you started with. So this is the bit that does something. See what you can make of it. Um, so it looks like it, it returns uh, each line, but uh, yeah, I'm not it. sure what builder does or. Right. So this that's a good point. So, um, so many of these filter methods just consist of doing something to each line that have actually kind of automated it and written this each line method which it just says give me some function and I will call it with every line in the pipe so if the pipe contains one two three on separate lines you know and you give me a function I'll call you with one I'll call you with two and I'll call you with three and you can do what you like with it um, and we don't really need to know how this works, but the upshot is if you pass me some func, um, this will get called once for each line with the contents of that line as this string. So, you know, if you want to refer to the line, refer to the parameter line. And I also need to give you something to write your output to. So this is going to be the, the pipe for everyone downstream, right? Um, so perhaps given those two things, you, we can start to see what um, this function is doing. So what do we, um, do? What do, we do here? Here's our yeah. friend, the file path library again. It, it has a base function which does exactly what we want. So again, I'm not really doing anything, <laughs> just wrapping the standard library and getting GitHub stars as a result. It's a great life. <laughs> and here's the line that we give it. So file path base will do the stripping off of uh, everything. And it gives us back just the file name. So then what do we do with it? So 
Um, so does it convert the file name into, into a string? Or yep, that's right. We get the file name back as a string. Uh, but why do we have to then use a rune? Ah, that's very interesting. So um, we have, so to make it concrete, let's say it's slash Etsy slash foo.txt. And uh, we've called filepath.base and it's given us back just foo.txt. And we're going to write it to our output strings builder, um, which as we saw is just a thing you can keep writing strings to and then it will give you it all as one string. But we need line breaks too, because this is a line oriented library. So we're reading a path name from each line separated by line breaks. And then in our output, of course, we need to add our own line break on because we we didn't get it. So when we get past the line, it doesn't have a line break on the end. Oh, got it. So it, it just helps format it and add a, adds a break to it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And you, you could call write string and give it the string that just consists of the new line rune, but it actually has write rune if you only want to write a single character. So that's what that does. So what we're really saying here is, um, you know, each of these methods, like base name, just calls each line to say, do whatever it is once for each line. And then inside the little funk that we pass, we just do whatever it is we need to do, like file path dot base. Um, that was very good. Thank you. Would you like to tackle the next one? Uh, sure, I could try. <laughs> this is the cut um, command. So this is about saying we have some white space delimited stuff, and I'm interested in let's say field number one or column number one. Like uh, if you think of Unix ps command or something, for example, we get the process ID and the information about the memory and the command that created the process and all of these things. So we might be wanting to grab one of those columns. Um, but why, um, why do we need that? Good question. <laughs> I'm not sure if we do. Um, but, um, for example, you know, in, um, in my, um, example, uh, sort of demo program is, I think we use column to say, uh, in our log file, uh, this is what the data looks like. Uh, be familiar to the sysadmins among us. <laughs> so Apache log data. So the first thing is the IP address um, and some empty fields, the timestamp, uh, what the request was, the response code and so on and so forth. We don't care about any of that other stuff. We just want column one. Um, oh, yeah. So what we're really saying is just split it into um, white space delimited fields and give me whichever number I ask for. So it, it just makes it more readable and gives you exactly the data you're looking for. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So um, how, how does that work? Um, so it goes through, it looks like it goes through each line and then uh, Yep, same thing again, isn't it? We're calling yeah. our reach line thing and we're giving it this funk. So now this is the bit we're interested in. Yes. So fields. Have you come across strings fields before? Uh no. So no. guess what? It does exactly what we need. <laughs> Standard library wins again. If you give it a string, it splits it on white space and gives you okay. back all, all the non white space strings as a slice. Oh, okay. So um, basically it, it creates the various, it, it just, uh, but does it format it into columns? Is that how it works? Yeah. So if we gave it that log line that we were just looking at, um, mm -hmm. strings fields would return us one string, which is the IP address, another string, which is a dash, another dash, the, the request 
and timestamp and so forth. Um, so we now have a slice of columns, if you like. Okay. Let's, um, and then... Um, what that says, John, is pretty much that slice is now, now being... Not that it's setting up columns, but it, it's putting it in a slice, so now you can use the indexes for getting the data out of it. Yeah, thank you. That's a much better way to say it. So the first... The first slice, uh, first string in this slice will be column. Will be the first column of our right. input. Uh, exactly. Should should we return an error when it uh, requests an out of range uh, index because you are just like ignoring? Yeah. So um, this, I think Shimano was about to say this that if you we have all the columns and we know which column it is we want because that was the argument so we could have just said return columns square bracket col mm -hmm. minus one because <laughs> computers start from zero for some reason um but there we can have an error because we might have said give me column 99 and maybe there are only five columns or something so in that case so you very rightly ask what should we do um, the answer here is nothing, because that's kind of <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way script is designed to work. In that it assumes you know what you're doing, because you have root access, so uh, it's all down to you. Um, and what we're saying is that maybe one line in my input was not the expected format or something. Maybe it was the header line, or maybe it was empty, or just you know, but it, it doesn't fit with the rest of my data. And in that case, I'm going to just ignore it. Gotcha. I think cut does the same thing. So if, if you call Unix yeah, cut tool, um, it doesn't right. crash, does it? It doesn't stop with an error and saying, whoa, 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 there wasn't a field number 99 at this line. It just carries on. Yeah, like so, the same for AWK. You're right. Right. Yeah, and that's what we do too, is we just try and struggle on we could have set the error flag on the pipe, um, but that's really a signal to somebody right at the far end of the pipe saying, hey, don't use any of that stuff that I gave you. It's it's all invalid because there was a serious error at some point. And this isn't really that serious. It's just saying, hey, most of the stuff I tried to do worked fine, but there were one or two bits that didn't. Mm -hmm. So, and we've seen this bit before, haven't we? Um, so it just uh, re returns um, strings, yeah, and exactly. then um, yeah, and and then any any space becomes a, a so, and uh, it it also uh, go. Uh, how would that work though? Um, so it it would return a string. For each column. Yeah, so we 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 used strings fields to split the line into substrings for us, and then so we if we have n columns, you know, we have n strings in this slice. We pick the one that we want minus one. Um, that is now the string we're interested in, the IP address, let's say. So we'll write that string to our writer, and mm -hmm. as you say, we throw away everything else. It's right a terminating new line, but effectively we throw away line after this. So that's exactly what we're here for, isn't it? Is we're here to strip out everything from every line that's not the column we're interested in. Okay. And do you think it would worth to accept a delimiter too? Yeah, that's very interesting. So as usual, if there's a decision to make, I'll punt it to either go or Unicode in this case. Um, I'm sure they know what they're doing. Um, they define certain code points as white space. Space would be an obvious one. Um, mm -hmm. Also tab, but also a million other things that you never thought of. Like I'm sure there's a special character in the Thai language that means white space. Um, and uh, we just say, 
I mean, the, we, we effectively don't even have to take the decision because strings fields does that. Um, I see. And in turn, strings fields calls Unicode dot is space, which will tell you if Unicode thinks it's white space. Um, and we saw in the example that cut does take a delimiter um, here. So the dash D flag says use space as the delimiter of fields, but it could be comma, for example, if we, if we mm -hmm. had CSV data, we could split by commas or by pipe characters or a dozen other things. Um, and we cannot do that here. Okay, gotcha. We can only do it by white space, as you say. And what I would probably do is um, for all kind of design things like this is I always want to make the 80% case super easy okay. to do and I don't want people to have to fill in a bunch of null paperwork just because they're not doing the 10 or 20% case mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to have an extra argument to column which is delimiter you know and now now you have to specify that every time you call even though 99% of the time you'll only be interested in white space what I do instead is I might add a method called something like column by or you know column delimited by or something like that we'll bike shed the name but that's the idea is we use a different method mm -hmm. so you can still do what you want to do but if you just want the easy case then you have no paperwork to do it's just like mm -hmm. HTTP is always my canonical example of this is if you want a plain old HTTP client with no special customizations you don't even need a client you just called HTTP.get and yeah. you'll be using the default client. But if you want to customize things, and you absolutely should, timeouts would be a good example, uh, then, you, then you can call something else, HTTP new client, and you can start okay. customizing it, and then you can call get on that. So same kind of idea. Make the easy stuff easy, and the complicated stuff possible. Makes sense. But yeah, that's a great idea. So please feel free to open an issue on my GitHub repo, you'll find it on Bitfield's GitHub. And um, if you feel like contributing a PR for it, that would be even better. Sure thing. So yeah, I think we better wrap up there, haven't we? Which is a shame because I've enjoyed this, but um, we're somewhat over time. So thanks very good. much, everybody. I'm going to use this code. Excellent. Well, please, yeah. please pay me $5 every time <laughs> you import this library. <laughs> and uh, if GitHub stars are anything to go by, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that I'm not, so uh, something's gone wrong there. You should put a web call for your site and count how many times each person is. <laughs> I would love to put some evil telemetry in there that reports to me every time someone runs code using my library. But I kind of feel like, you know, if I made it opt in, no one would opt in. And if I made it opt out, then I'd be arrested by the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. guys. Thank you very much. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, everybody. See you again next time. Bye.